Uh, welcome to the joint colloquium today. We believe the universe started with the Big Bang when everything was ionized. The cosmic expansion then cooled things down and um, neutral atoms and molecules formed. Naively, we would expect that the material surrounding us in the present day universe would remain neutral, but that's not the case. About 12 billion years ago, some things reionized the universe. And this process is known as the cosmic reionization or cosmic dawn. Understanding the details of cosmic dawn has um, in, uh, profound implications on galaxy formation. And today, uh, we are honored to have a leading figure in this field to tell us all about it. Professor Richard Ellis, uh, got his PhD from Oxford University in 1974 and held professorship in Durham University, uh, University of Cambridge, and Caltech. Since uh, 2015, he returned to the UK and now is uh, in University College London. Professor Ellis is a big icon in the field of galaxy formation and cosmology. Um, and is recognized by numerous awards. I'll just mention uh, the Breakthrough Award uh, for Fundamental Physics uh, for his work with the supernova team that discovered uh, cosmic accelerating expansion uh, and uh, gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society and uh, uh, the commander of the Order of the British Empire for his service in international sciences. So uh, let's welcome Professor Ellis. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, 
It's very nice to be here. I'm going to tell you about the work we're doing in exploring the early universe. Um, what you see here is the deepest image uh, that we currently have um, taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. It is a, a very small field of the sky, about a tenth of the diameter of the full moon, and it represents a uh, total exposure time of about 10 days with the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, these little colored squares here represent uh, some of the most distant objects that we see uh, in this image. When we use a telescope to look uh, deep in the universe, we're looking back in time because the universe is very big and light rays take a long time uh, to reach the Hubble Space Telescope from these remote objects. So this image is a time tunnel. We're seeing uh, back to when the universe was only about 5% of its present age. So this is real exploration. So what I'm gonna tell you about is the work that we've been doing in exploring this very early phase of the universe's history. And I'm gonna start with a little bit of history. Um, so uh, the title of my talk includes the word galaxy. And of course, you probably know that the Milky Way is thought to be a spiral galaxy, uh, the sun, is in is one of something like uh, 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 stars in the Milky Way. And the first person to realize that we are sitting in a galaxy like the Milky Way uh, is this man, Thomas Wright. Uh, he wasn't an astronomer. He was a landscape gardener. And he actually figured out that if the sun is embedded in a disk of stars, then when you look along uh, the plane of that disk, you see uh, this circle on the sky, which we call the Milky Way, whereas when you look at right angles to it, uh, you don't see that same richness of stars. He uh, wrote this in a book in 1750, which was published by the Royal Society, and if he'd have stopped here, he might have been quite famous, but unfortunately, he embellished his picture of the universe he thought that there was a supreme being at the center of the Milky Way, and the book is rather fanciful, uh, and he wasn't really a scientist, so he's probably not very well remembered, but he is the first person to realize the nature <coughs> of the Milky Way that we see on the sky. <coughs> Someone who's much more like a modern-day astronomer was William Herschel. He was born in Germany, but he moved to England, and he built his own telescopes. Uh, this is one of them. It's called the 20-foot telescope. That's uh, the length of this tube. It is um, something like a half-meter mirror. He, he made his own mirrors, not from glass, but from metal. Uh, and you can see he would have to climb up here and use uh, an eyepiece up here uh, to observe the night sky. And he would have assistance that would enable him to rotate this telescope uh, and he made measurements, um, both of the distribution of stars in the sky and their distance, and he came with the idea that there was a galaxy, which he called the Milky Way. But in 1789, he noticed there were other nebulae, what he called nebulae, a phrase which means something that's extended and not star-like. And these nebulae, uh, he thought some of them, not all of them, uh, might be external to the Milky Way. In other words, other galaxies. Well, that's 1789, and it took until 1929 uh, for Hubble, whose name, of course, graces the Hubble Space Telescope, to realize that this Andromeda spiral is actually outside the Milky Way. And so you need to measure a distance, obviously, and the way in which this was done is a certain class of star is a pulsating star. This is a, a, a stable radial pulsation of a hot star. And the period of this pulsation, this is what we call a light curve. So this is the variation in the signal of the star as a function of days. And for those at the back, this each of these little ticks here is 10 days. So you can see the star is varying in its brightness periodically. And this period 
is known in the Milky Way to correlate with the luminosity of the star. So if you measure the period of these stars in the Andromeda spiral and you estimate their period, you get their true luminosity. And since you know how apparently bright they are, you get a distance. And at a stroke, we realized, well, I didn't, I wasn't there at the time. In 1929, we realized that this object is external to the Milky Way. So I'm going to take you now from these nearby galaxies to much more distant ones. And I told you that uh, the universe is a big place. And of course, you probably know that the universe is expanding. Now, it's dangerous to think of the expansion of the universe as galaxies moving as projectiles in empty pre-existing space. That is not the explanation for the expansion of the universe. It is space itself that is expanding. And to first order, the galaxies are stationary with respect to um, sitting on top of that uh, expanding universe. So imagine uh, the light from a galaxy at the bottom here is moving towards uh, the Earth or the Milky Way, which is this galaxy here. Then the light ray is taking so long to reach us that during this time, space has stretched. And when this light ray reaches the Earth, it has been stretched by the expansion of the universe. And this we call the redshift. Uh, and is the ratio of the wavelength that was emitted uh, to the wavelength that's received, uh, minus one. And we can relate this redshift. It tells us by how much the universe has expanded since the light ray left that galaxy. So we can actually, a redshift of zero would be something very, very nearby. Uh, a redshift of one would be a wavelength that has doubled. So it's one plus redshift is the change in wavelength. And this can be related to the, uh, what we call the look back time. So imagine uh, we're here today when the universe is, is just under 13, 14 billion years old then if we look to a redshift of one, it predates the solar system. We're looking back about halfway to the Big Bang. And so if we look to uh, successively higher redshifts, uh, we're looking back to when the universe was very, very young. So in this image that I showed you, we have the potential to time slice the universe and determine the evolution of the universe as a whole. So it's a, it's a very exciting observational adventure to piece together the history of, the, of, the, of galaxies in the universe. So how do we find these distant galaxies? Well, you might think that the faintest objects are the most distant, but this is dangerous because galaxies don't all have the same intrinsic luminosity. There are feeble ones and there are luminous ones. So we need a trick and one of the best tricks that emerged in the 1990s uh, is to use the fact that hydrogen, which is very common in the universe, the most common element, uh, absorbs the light from a galaxy in the ultraviolet. And when this absorption uh, is shifted by the expansion of the universe uh, into the optical, then a distant object, such as this one here, which is seen in a red filter a green filter, it disappears in the ultraviolet. Why does it disappear? Because the expansion of the universe at these great distances is sufficient that this absorption from hydrogen has occulted the light from this object uh, and uh, eliminated its flux in the ultraviolet. These other galaxies, which you can see are still present in the ultraviolet image, are in the foreground, they're not as far away. So we can use this three filter technique uh, to locate, in this particular case, galaxies at a redshift of three. That's the stretching of the light that brings this ultraviolet filter uh, into view. So just to go back here, a redshift of three is when the universe is only a, few bit, a couple of billion years old, two or three billion years old. But we can use this technique using the, the filters on the Hubble Space Telescope to disappear galaxies at any redshift that we like 
up to a redshift of about 10. So these are filters on board the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, these are in the optical. These are in the red region of the spectrum. These are in the near infrared. All of these are filters that were manufactured and placed on Hubble Space Telescope. And as the redshift of a hypothetical galaxy increases, it successively disappears at longer and longer wavelengths. This absorption from hydrogen, which we call the Lyman break, after a transition in hydrogen in the ultraviolet, is being redshifted by the expansion of the universe to longer and longer wavelengths. So using Hubble, we've pieced together what galaxies look like by this technique from today. So here are two uh, very nearby galaxies. This one very much like the Milky Way, a spiral galaxy with a nucleus. This one is a very smooth galaxy, which we call an elliptical galaxy. <coughs> if we go back to when the universe was only 5 billion years old, these are pictures from Hubble, and you can see these two objects uh, look pretty similar to this object. And although these aren't as beautiful spirals as this one, they bear some resemblance. And then there are also these irregular galaxies. There are a few irregular galaxies today, but there seem to be many more uh, at this time. But let's go back to when the universe was only a billion years old. You can see these galaxies now don't look like anything uh, that we can see today. They're physically smaller. Uh, many of them have multiple components as if they're growing by merging with one another and assembling. And none of them have these regular features, spiral structure or smooth light distributions. This slide encapsulates what we knew maybe about uh, the beginning of the century, 2000, from a lot of work with Hubble Space Telescope. It gives us a view of the history of galaxies over about 90% of cosmic history. But as Yantin mentioned in the introduction, the challenge now is to go even further back to when galaxies first formed. And as usual, uh, there are theoreticians. And theoreticians are able to explain, without any observations, what might have happened at this early time. So this is a picture from uh, one of my favorite theorists. He's a professor at Harvard University. And in a Scientific American article a few years ago, uh, he arranged for this nice cartoon. So this is the Big Bang. So time is running forward from left to right. And as Yentin mentioned, as, as we see the glow from the Big Bang, the universe expands and cools, and eventually the hydrogen atom forms for the very first time. Uh, but there's no starlight. It's just dark hydrogen clouds. Now, you may have heard of dark matter. It's an embarrassment that we don't know what it is, but there's a lot of it. And this dark matter acts as a focusing gravitational potential that brings in these hydrogen clouds into where the dark matter is clustered. And eventually, these clumps of hydrogen become unstable under gravity, and they collapse. And as they collapse, the potential energy is converted into heat, and the hydrogen ignites nuclear fu fusion, and we get starlight. Now, these stars are very different from the stars that we see in the Milky Way. They don't have any heavy elements. Everything that you see around us today, metals, carbon, iron, was synthesized in stars. It wasn't produced in the Big Bang. So these stars are chemically pristine. They only have hydrogen and helium. So they're much hotter for a given mass uh, than, say, the sun. So they emit a lot of ultraviolet light, and this ultraviolet light has enough energy to ionize the hydrogen and create these ionized bubbles. So you see these bubbles get bigger. They expand with time as more, uh, more stars form and produce more ionizing radiation. And eventually, these ionized bubbles overlap. And today, in deep space, 
the universe is completely and fully ionized. Now, this picture links two things. It links a major transition in the universe from a neutral medium to an ionized one, and it explains that this occurred due to the birth of galaxies, which we call cosmic dawn. Here's a simulation. Uh, this is from the group at Stanford University. This is a box of space. The expansion of the universe has been removed from this box so that it can be kept on the screen. And these ionized bubbles are shown in blue here. And they expand and they interconnect with one another, like cheese, Swiss cheese. And as time progresses, uh, these volumes become completely ionized and the universe ends up as being entirely uh, ionized. It is a little bit of a slow movie, but this is 500 million years of cosmic history. So how far can we see with our telescopes? So I told you about redshift, and this is the age of the universe that corresponds to that redshift. So here we are today. The universe is 13.8 billion years. And as we look out to uh, the frontier, we're looking at when the universe was only uh, five or 10% or of its present age. This is the publication date of the most distant confirmed object that has been seen by astronomers. And, uh, you know, my career began, I was an undergraduate here. Okay, and uh, here we are today. And you can see there's been huge progress thanks to the development of big telescopes. Um, galaxies are now being seen out well into a period where this reionization uh, might have occurred. So what are the questions? This is an observational adventure, but what are we trying to address? Firstly, when did all this happen? When did this reionization begin and end? Uh, secondly, are we, do we have sufficiently powerful telescopes that we can actually witness the birth of the very first galaxies? And secondly, or thirdly, the most uh, important thing is, is this picture that Avi Loeb, that theorist, presented, that the two are connected. That is, the cosmic reionization was generated by galaxies. Is that correct? Is, are there enough galaxies? And do they have enough energy to break apart all of the hydrogen in the universe and make it completely ionized. Well, we have one very clever way of determining when this might have happened. And you probably have read um, that we see the glow from the Big Bang directly in what is called a microwave background. So the thermal glow of the Big Bang was detected in 1965 and satellites have over the years uh, analyzed the signal from the glow from the Big Bang in great detail. And the most recent measurements were made with a satellite called the Planck satellite, a European satellite which has just finished its observations. And it found that the microwave background is polarized. The light from the glow from the Big Bang is linearly polarized. And the vectors of this polarization are sensitive to electron scattering. So remember, the universe is neutral to begin with and then becomes ionized. So there's a column of electrons between us and when reionization begins. And this scattering, Thomson scattering, or electron scattering of the microwave background is a measurable quantity with the Planck satellite. And the Planck mission claims that the universe was neutral uh, that is, neutral atomic hydrogen about 500 million years after the Big Bang, and in only five, a further 500 million years transitioned from being neutral uh, to being fully ionized. Corresponding, if you, can, if you can think in terms of redshift, of 12 uh, down to a redshift of 6 or so. So this is very exciting because redshift 6 to 12 is an area where we are beginning to probe galaxies 
uh, with Hubble. Now, can we believe this result from the Planck mission? Is there any way we can verify uh, this polarization signal uh, with other methods? And the answer is uh, we can certainly constrain the end of reionization because we can look at very luminous objects called quasars. So a quasar is a galaxy with a very massive black hole in the nucleus uh, and the non-thermal radiation from material falling into the black hole produces a very luminous signal. And we can use that as a beacon uh, to highlight the absorption from hydrogen along the line of sight. So if you think of this, it's like a torch that's shining towards the telescope. And we can see in the spectrum uh, fluctuations in the signal uh, that represent absorption or lack of absorption from hydrogen. So along one dimension, it gives you a one dimensional slice of these ionized bubbles. Where there's ionized bubbles, uh, the light is not completely extinguished. And where the gas is still neutral, um, the light from the quasar is completely extinguished. This is real data from my postdoc, Sarah Bosman at UCL. These are real spectra of quasars. So this is uh, wavelength. <laughs> And these are all taken with large telescopes. So you see the light of the quasar. And then when hydrogen absorption is present, you see the light of the quasar is extinguished. But sometimes little peaks of light emerge, and that's due to these ionized bubbles. So um, it's possible that as we go to higher redshift, uh, you can see that the signal uh, gets more and more obscured. Uh, there's fluctu there's, it's fairly patchy from one area, one sight line to another, but there are several hundred of these quasars now that have been studied, and they give us the idea that indeed the Planck people are correct, and that there is this transition uh, around a redshift of six. There is another technique which I've been using with my students, and that is this um, hydrogen can also uh, be seen in galaxies in emission. So those of you familiar with the hydrogen atom will remember n equals 2 to n equals 1. This is the ground state, is Lyman alpha, the Lyman alpha transition. This is a very common uh, line in galaxies that are forming stars. The gas is heated, the hydrogen gas is heated, and it emits this line. It's very, very bright. And when this line uh, is produced in an ionized bubble, uh, it's not scattered. Uh, it travels to the edge of the bubble um, and, and escapes. But if the line is emitted in a neutral region, uh, it's what we call a resonant line, and it's easily scattered. And so it becomes very, very hard to see. So um, it's a complex idea. Let me give you a little analogy. Imagine uh, you're looking down the freeway, uh, every car, is a galaxy, every uh, headlamp is this glowing Lyman alpha line, and as you look into the dark ages where the neutral gas is present, it dims the, the headlight and you don't see this line. So you would expect this line to be less and less visible as you look further into uh, this uh, period of reionization. So these are spectra taken with the Keck telescope. This is a big 10 meter telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii that my students and I have been exploiting. This is a spectrum. You can see the hydrogen line is very, very strong. These are negative images of this glowing line in many galaxies. The red shift of the line is shown in, in numbers here. These little stripes are uh, uh, night skylines in the Earth's atmosphere. So when we observe from the ground, we have a lot of difficulty peering through structure in the night sky itself. And you can see we can just about squeak through and see these lines. And so when we've done this, uh, we're able to look at um, uh, the visibility of this line. And you can see at a redshift of six, about 60% of the galaxies show this line, and then it drops markedly as you go to higher redshift. Again, consistent with the universe transitioning into this dark ages um, and neutral gas 
uh, redshifts uh, beyond six. So let me diverse for a minute and say astronomy, I know many of you are physicists, some of you are astronomers, Astronomer, astronomy is very exciting, uh, but it is uh, big science and we have to go to the telescope. So we don't have laboratories in the department. Our laboratory is often at a remote mountain top, a long, long way away somewhere, completely at a different part of the world. And um, there's no more exciting moment that when you're at the telescope and students uh, can control the telescope directly themselves and we have the computing skills to analyze this data in real time and let me tell you there's nothing more exciting than making a discovery at the telescope in real time it is possible to observe remotely over the internet but often i find it's much more exciting to go to the telescope with my students uh, because we focus on nothing else, there's no distractions, and we can work directly uh, with the data at the telescope. There is one disadvantage of going to the telescope, and that's cloudy weather. So you can go all the way to Hawaii, uh, which is a long way from London, and you can find many nights are clouded out. This is a cloudy night photograph, okay? <laughs> and uh, this guy is one of my students. He's just finished his thesis. He's very happy. This guy's Italian. They're always happy. <laughs> um, this guy here, his entire thesis is disappearing because these nights were his thesis. <laughs> and so, you know, my job as professor is to buy the pizza and the bottle of wine. And that's why this photograph is slightly blurred. Okay. <laughs> So I told you about the end of reionization. Let me tell you about the beginning of reionization. So the Planck people claimed, as I told you, that uh, reionization begins at a redshift of about 12. And if you go to their paper, they say they disfavored any major contribution uh, out to redshifts of 15. But um, this claim is refuted by theorists and some theorists including this group here in uh, Pisa in Italy claim that there could be a tail of activity uh, beyond a redshift of 12 a small amount of star formation from the beginning of galaxies out maybe as high as a redshift of 15 or so so I told you about this deep image this we call the Hubble ultra deep field. It's amusing Hubble first did a deep field and then people thought, well, why don't we be even more ambitious? So then it did an ultra deep field and then we've revisited again and got an even deeper field and there's an extreme deep field and so forth. So this is the image we took in 2012 uh, and I showed you this already. This was a, a, a most exciting project uh, from a very small group of us um, here viewed at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, but there is another way that we can explore the early universe as well. And that's through a phenomenon which Einstein predicted called gravitational lensing. So I don't know how many of you have come across gravitational lensing, but light from a distant object can be distorted by a foreground mass. So what you see here, obviously this is a cartoon, you see a cluster of galaxies. Uh, the cluster is not that far away, uh, and the light from a distant galaxy is actually bent and magnified, just like in conventional optics. And this phenomenon of gravitational lensing uh, depends on the alignment of a background object uh, with the lens, in this case the cluster and the telescope, it depends on the relative distances, just like in conventional optics. And this year is the 100th anniversary of, this, uh, of the verification of this phenomenon. So Einstein uh, predicted gravitational lensing. Uh, he got it wrong when he first did it. He did it with special relativity. And he was predicting the, the distortion of starlight around the sun at the time of an eclipse. And there's two effects. There's the bending of light rays, and there's the distortion of space-time by the mass of the sun. And these two effects add together and produce a deflection of, a, of about one 
one and a half arc seconds, a very small effect. This gentleman, uh, Eddington, who was a professor at Cambridge, he was a, a very, very distinguished theorist. He saw the light and decided to become an observer. And he went uh, to Africa and uh, took photographs at the time of the eclipse. <coughs> and he confirmed the deflection <coughs> of starlight around the sun. Now, Eddington and Einstein never thought that gravitational lensing would have any utility in astronomy. And the reason they were skeptical is the probability of two stars being aligned in the Milky Way very precisely is very, very small. I know there are a lot of stars in the Milky Way, but the chance that two stars would line up directly with the Earth is very, very remote. But what they didn't realize was these clusters of galaxies are very big structures on the sky. And so their cross-section uh, to background objects is much greater. So here's a simulation uh, of a dark gravitational lens moving across one of these Hubble images. And you can see it's really quite spectacular. You can get complete rings. You can get distorted images. And even a long way away from the lens, you can see these tiny distortions. So gravitational lensing is now a very big business in astronomy. Entire satellites are planned to be launched in the next few years just to exploit uh, this remarkable phenomenon. So we've used uh, what I would call deep field, that's pointing Hubble in one place for a long time, and gravitational lensing to explore the number of galaxies, if you like, a census, all the way to as far as we can look. And uh, this is a log scale, so you can see from, say, uh, a time redshift 3 uh, out to a redshift of 10, you know, there's almost a thousand, a factor of a thousand drop in the abundance of objects. And there's some evidence, it's controversial, but there's some evidence that there's this steepening beyond a redshift of 8 when the universe is about 600 million years. So it's hinting to us that, you know, the beginning of galaxies is somewhere out here. Now, sadly, we can't observe with Hubble out here. Hubble doesn't go to long enough wavelengths to observe beyond a redshift of about 10. So one of the challenges is, is there any other way of exploring this period before we wait for future facilities? So current facilities cannot observe sources beyond a redshift of 11 or so. Is there any way of figuring out what happened out here? And the answer is we can take galaxies that are being seen as far as we possibly can and try to estimate how old they are, how long they've been there. Are they, are they recent arrivals or have they been there for 100 million years or 200 million years? Look how time is compressed at high redshift. So redshift and time are not linearly related. The expansion of the universe is not a simple linear phenomenon. So if we could measure the age of a galaxy uh, to an accuracy of 100 million years, at this redshift, we probe back to redshifts of 12 or so. If we can measure the age to 200 million years, we can even probe to earlier times. So last year, uh, my team in London, and here we are at the very large telescope in Chile, uh, we observed this object. It is a gravitationally lensed galaxy. It's, it's very faint. It's in this little square here, but I've zoomed in on it here. This is the cluster that does the lensing. It's much closer to the Earth. And we use two facilities. I'll introduce ALMA in a moment. This is called the Very Large Telescope. It's this array of four telescopes in Chile, and we measured the redshift of this object to be 9.1. So let's go back here. So that's when the universe is just over 500 million years old. And what we found in this object is there are old stars. So if you look here in the ultraviolet, we see young stars. And then as we go to the optical, uh, we see the signature of older stars. And these stars, we think, are as old as 290 million years. 
So this galaxy has been around for 290 million years at this redshift of, of nine, and that takes us back to a redshift of 15, which is only 250 million years after the Big Bang. So this got a lot of attention in the press uh, last year, uh, and we've been looking at uh, uh, further objects, uh, which I can discuss if people are interested. We're working on an object right now that looks as if it's confirming this uh, measurement. So I told you about this facility, ALMA, uh, and let me introduce why ALMA is important, and that's dust. Now, everybody knows where dust is. It's behind your refrigerator, okay? But this isn't that kind of dust, okay? What do I mean by celestial dust? I mean uh, material in deep space. Uh, these are micron-sized grains of various chemical components. Uh, and at early times, we think most of them are produced in supernova, exploding stars. And if we can estimate the amount of dust, then it tells us whether that galaxy has lived long enough to produce exploding stars and heavy elements. After all, these are made of elements like carbon and silicon and so forth. So what is ALMA? Well, it's a very, very powerful facility. It's been around for four years. It's an interferometer. An interferometer is an array of individual telescopes that function in concert as one facility. It's configurable. You can move these antenna around and create um, maps of different resolution. And it works at long wavelengths where this dust uh, emits uh, thermal radiation. So the dust is heated by stars. The dust glows like, like embers in a fire. And we pick up that thermal radiation uh, with ALMA. So my postdoc, Nicholas Laporte, uh, detected dust in another lensed object. Uh, this green contour is the thermal glow from this galaxy. This is the Hubble image beneath it. And <coughs> this object, we know the redshift of this object because we see a line from oxygen. Uh, it's at a redshift of 8.38. So far, there are three dust detections in, the, in this period of reionization. Uh, here's Laporte again. Uh, there's another one from the Japanese group, 8.31, another one from a group in Denmark, uh, 7.5. The idea here is to take these dust masses and try to estimate uh, how long that galaxy has been around. And uh, this is where we are at the moment. If I combine these two techniques, old stars and dust, then although these objects are seen below a redshift of 10, we're beginning to penetrate you know, how long they've been around, out to uh, redshifts of 11 to 15 when the universe was only three to 400 million years old. So let me turn to the final question, and that's are there enough galaxies to do this job of reionizing the universe? This is a little bit technical. I'm gonna just break it down into three components. How many galaxies there are, uh, how much ionizing radiation they produce, and what fraction of those ionizing photons get out of the galaxies. And uh, if we assume uh, some numbers, then it really does look like the number of galaxies can explain this scattering of the polarization uh, that I introduced from the Planck satellite. Remember this column density of electrons. Um, we know the luminosity density of galaxies. We can estimate the number of galaxies as a function of their brightness. And so we know this first term, uh, this one here, the number of density of galaxies to about 20% or so. Uh, we can diagnose the radiation field uh, from uh, lines of different ionization, carbon, oxygen, and so forth. Uh, we know these are produced in gas that's heated by stars. But some of the lines uh, may tell us that there are black holes in the early universe. And sure enough, we see some of these uh, intense lines with very high ionization uh, potentials uh, that tell us that there's <coughs> a contribution from black holes, even at early times. And then finally, how much radiation escapes? Well, why does the radiation have a hard time escaping? Well, of course, an early galaxy has a lot of hydrogen 
and not all of it is ionized, and so this escaping radiation can be trapped. We need at least 10% of these photons to get out of a typical galaxy. And we think we have a way of doing that. This is another one of my postdocs, Koki Kokichi, uh, and he's correlating uh, the positions of galaxies with fluctuations that I showed you earlier in the spectrum of a quasar. And uh, if we look at that in detail, it's giving us an average fraction uh, of about 20, 10% or so. So I realize this is all a little bit technical, uh, but that's pretty well the end of my talk. Let me just say, um, try to summarize in simple terms where we are. Firstly, um, understanding the role of galaxies in this transition is probably the most practical way of going back and finding their history. Um, we're now beginning to probe this period uh, out to redshifts of 12, and age dating the galaxies suggests that this cosmic dawn occurred when the universe was about 250 million years old. Uh, there's always challenges. Uh, I was at a conference last week in Cambridge. There's a lot of discussion about this escape fraction of ionizing photons. Uh, we don't know how much contribution there is from black holes. We don't know whether black holes were ubiquitous in the early universe. But the future is very bright because we have these upcoming facilities. So we have James Webb Space Telescope due for launch in 2021. The proposals for that are due next year. So we're working very hard now in planning for Hubble's successor. This is a six and a half meter telescope. Uh, that will be launched deep in space. It will extend the wavelength range of Hubble so that we can see into this early period uh, redshifts beyond 11. There's a series of large telescopes being constructed. Uh, the European uh, extremely large telescope, remember they had a name, the Very Large Telescope. Uh, originally, they were going to build a 100-meter telescope. They called it the overwhelmingly large telescope. <laughs> but then they couldn't quite afford that, so they scaled it back, and now it's called the extremely large telescope. Uh, the giant Magellan telescope uh, by a consortium of American universities and Korea uh, in uh, Chile, and the 30-meter telescope, uh, which involves Japan, China, uh, India, California, uh, uh, hopefully on Mauna Kea, but if you've been reading the papers, you know there's a lot of problems with putting this big telescope on Mauna Kea. Hopefully, in the next five years, all of these telescopes uh, will see completion. Uh, certainly, the European Extremely Large Telescope is expected to come online in 2025. Could we see the birth directly? I have told you about indirect ways, and the answer is if I take this object at 9.1, and I fold back how bright it would have been uh, at redshifts 12 to 14, uh, it is within reach of the James Webb Space Telescope. So there is actually some prospect of getting data to find the actual moment when galaxies like that switched on, which I think is the sort of holy grail of, uh, of this subject. So I'm going to end with, uh, with Hubble. Uh, so here's Hubble. Uh, he was a very interesting man. He was uh, obviously an American, but he came to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar to study law. So he, and he was a boxer. Um, and when he was in Oxford, he became very, uh, uh, he was a very uh, full of admiration for England. And he picked up this English accent. And when he went back to California, he was very unpopular because people imagined he was, you know, he was putting on this accent. It wasn't really uh, his accent at all. Um, he uh, uh, became, of course, very famous. Um, and uh, he wrote a book in 1932, a uh, series of lectures at, at Yale University. Uh, and you can read this book. If you haven't read it, you really should. It's a very exciting book called The Realm of the Nebulae. It's been reprinted. You can buy it on Amazon. And in this book is this very famous phrase, you know, at the last dim horizon, we search among ghostly errors of observations. The search will continue. The urge is older than history. And this probing out there, you know, to explore what's out there at the edge of the universe is certainly what's driven my career. And I thank you very much for listening to my talk. Thank you.
you very much. Questions? Silence. Yeah. Um, is there a way to characterize the role of documentary during the process of reionization? Yeah, so the question is, is, you know, what does reionization tell us about dark matter? Well, firstly, let me explain that in the early universe, we think that the dark matter is non baryonic material, and therefore it's separated from the expansion of the universe before the microwave background glow uh, was released. And so what that means is dark matter had a head start in clustering amongst itself. And so when finally the hydrogen atom formed, um, it was naturally attracted uh, to the dark matter. So the first point to make is without dark matter, the growth of these galaxies wouldn't have happened. And in fact, we wouldn't be here today. So dark matter is crucial for the growth of structure. So the next question is, if we can measure when reionization begins and ends, does it tell us anything about dark matter? And the answer is yes. If the dark matter is so, if what, what we call cold, that is, it has very little interaction with itself other than gravity, um, and it's cold in terms of uh, non-relativistic, uh, then we expect um, you know, reionization to occur at a certain time. But if the dark matter is slightly warm or self-interacting, it can affect when reionization began. Now, uncertainty, the uncertainty at the moment in when reionization began is too great for this to be applied. But there is the hope with James Webb that these measurements of when reionization began will also confirm whether the dark matter is completely uh, cold. <clears> Hi, <throat> right, great talk. Um, I have uh, one comment and one question. And the comment is about uh, you encourage your students go to the mountain to to do observation. Mm. <laughs> and my experience is that if you go to four hundred uh, four thousand meters. Uh, one drawback is that uh, your brain is completely blank. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot think. And that, and that uh, attitude. Um, and the question is, um, you uh, mentioned that uh, you can push the first galaxy to uh, redshift 15. Mm. And uh, based on um, the discovery of uh, an old population or star. Right. And what what would be the caveat if you, uh, um, I mean, if this is true, then it's very remarkable, but uh, is there any caveat in, in inter interpreting this uh, Z equal to 15, 15 galaxy? Yeah. Okay, so firstly, um, we are not at the summit of Mauna Kea in this photograph. So we are uh, at the base facility uh, at about 500 meters. Okay, so you are absolutely right. And early in my career, if we can imagine the world before the internet, early in my career, I was observing at 4,000 meters. And you are absolutely right that frequently uh, you know, it was very hard work. Okay, so uh, it's a very important question uh, that is asked about this redshift, uh, this implication that this object uh, formed um, its stars at redshift 15. And to just get a little bit technical, uh, it relies on this uh, so-called uh, Balmer break. And um, the interpretation of this Balmer break depends on uh, two things. Uh, it depends on um, the history of star formation up to that point, uh, you know, is it constant? Is it declining? Is it rising? So you can certainly, I didn't, I didn't put an error bar on here, but in the nature paper, uh, the uncertainty on this is plus or minus two. So it could be from 13 to 17. Um, what we try to illustrate is this is the, you know, this is the, the nicest way of getting some indication of how much activity there is beyond what we can see with Hubble. But you're absolutely right, there's, there's, there's uncertainty in, in the technique.
Thanks very much, Richard. It's very nice talk. I was wondering the, how the first galaxy impact on yeah. the how the first galaxy yeah. impact on the first on the later star uh, galaxy evolution. I mean, how the importance of law of the realization to, and the role of later galaxy we observe today. I still don't get the question. So, in terms of what? In how terms of the physics, gas the physics, yes. the gas dynamics. So, of course, those simulations uh, that I showed you, um, uh, are, the simulation I showed you originally from Stanford is just the physics of the gas in deep space. But I didn't have time to show you that there are simulations, uh, numerical simulations, uh, that attempt to fit, um, you know, the, the spectral energy distribution, the properties of the ionized gas. So you and I were at Cambridge last week, and you probably remember Harley Katz gave a talk. So these are hydrodynamic simulations of early objects. And what he's been trying to do is see whether he can reproduce the physical properties that we, uh, you know, is this object typical? And so the simulations have suggested that, you know, we can expect these kind of objects uh, in the volumes that we've been searching. So this is entirely based on the standard cosmology and the growth of structure, but they're hydro codes that take into account the cooling of the gas, you know, the initial mass function and so forth. There's obviously uncertainties in those simulations too. Uh, but there are several groups that are working on this, and they are, obviously they're very excited to try and reproduce these properties. I didn't have time, but you know that what we've been doing, and I, if you remember my talk in Cambridge, uh, we have four other objects uh, that are you know at various stages of analysis that look very similar to this galaxy. So I don't think this galaxy, uh, you know, is a special case. Thank you. Any other questions? Go. Um, so you show the fraction of lambda alpha mm. from galaxies mm. decrease after redshift six. Yeah. Is there any possibility this is caused by galaxy evolution rather than reionization? Yeah. Good question. So, um, so this is the fraction of galaxies selected in a certain way. This is a technical uh, slide, but this is a, you know, it's a, a range of luminosities. And really what we're trying to say is that this is such a sharp turnaround uh, that it seems unlikely, especially as the trend at lower redshift is, if anything, as we go back in time, galaxies are showing you know, more star formation you know, in, in more condensed and compact galaxies with more gas. So the trend, uh, as indicated here, would, you'd expect this to be rising, and if anything, it's dramatically reversing. Now remember that this is a very short time interval. You know, it's only 100 million years. So it would be quite remarkable for the universe to be so orchestrated that all of the galaxies suddenly reverse the trend uh, that they showed earlier. But you're right, there's a, you know, it could be a mixture of, of this. But I think this is one part of the evidence, together with Planck and the quasars, that reionization ended at six. <coughs> so you are trying to uh, age dating the, the earliest galaxies yeah. uh, with uh, some big error bars. Right, right now. Well, no, you know, compro you know, reasonable okay. error. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is a challenging task. Yeah, for sure. I'm just curious that um, if you push galaxies to uh, lower redshift, yes, uh, can you date that date their age better? And uh, yeah. if you have much larger sample, then that may put a stronger. Concept. Yes. Um, the answer, unfortunately, is. Um, Let's go to this slide. So, uh, you know, what Yun Ten is saying is, you know, if we come here, this galaxy is probably very much brighter and we have much better data than, you know, this galaxy out here, which is very faint. So certainly we could apply this technique here. The trouble is the accuracy um, is always more or less the same. 
you know, it's not, you know, the Obama break and its interpretation, you would get the break uh, much more, you know, you, you may be able to measure, you know, the photometry much more accurately, but the interpretation is always limited by not knowing the star formation history directly. And generally speaking, you can age date over a period of about two, three, four hundred million years. And, and after that, it becomes blurred in history. You know, like, for instance, we can't look at the Milky Way today and say, what was it like at Redshift 10? That's, you know, extrapolating too far back. So, you know, this, the data here may be better, but you have to go further back to make interesting measurements. So there's a sweet spot, you know, this uh, Redshift 9 seems to be as far as we can go where we can get, you know, high quality data from Hubble and Spitzer uh, and apply this technique. So as I mentioned previously, we've done four of these objects now. Um, and there is another effect, which is uh, technical, I'm afraid, and that is that if you come down to, say, a redshift of eight, then this enormous emission line pollutes this filter. And so, you, you know, in, and since you can't measure its spectrum because we don't have James Webb, then you can't account for it. So you've got to make sure that this crucial data point here is free from this emission line. And that forces you uh, to be uh, beyond a redshift of nine, unfortunately. Thank you. Any final questions? So today, Richard told us about uh, cosmic ionization, and tomorrow he will tell us another uh, exciting area of research, that is the formation of massive galaxies, uh, massive elliptical galaxies, over at the uh, Asia A, Zhong Yuan Tianwen Su. So if you're interested, please come for the talk tomorrow. And for now, let's thank Richard. Thank you.